So I'm here with Sharma Taylor for a conversation on her debut novel, What a Mother's Love Don't Teach You. Sharma is a personal friend, a motivator, and just an amazing writer, a lawyer by profession and a writer by passion. She um, has been shortlisted for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize. How many times now, Sharma? Four. <laughs> four times. Four times. That's just that's just a testimony to your, you know, your style, to the way that you reach an audience. It's just amazing to be here. Um, so I want you to tell us a little bit more about your story, your debut novel, um, and maybe read a couple of pages from your introduction to get us uh, a little bit more familiar with the setting, the characters. My debut novel is called What a Mother's Love Don't Teach You. So this beautiful book published by Virago Press. Um, and it's basically set in the mid eighties in, in Jamaica. And it concerns a, a woman named Dinah, who is a helper maid. And what happens is 18 years before, she'd given up her baby to her employers who were an American expat couple living in Jamaica. And um, fast forward 18 years, she's working with a different couple in Jamaica and they have friends from abroad who bring their son, Apollo, and Dinah is convinced that this boy is her long lost baby boy who she had named Sunstone. So the novel then explores, you know, how that connection between the two basically splinters everyone's lives around, including the community in which, the inner city community in which Dinah lives. Um, so I'm going to read a few pages uh, just to set the tone, I must say, the book is told in Jamaican part one, there are a lot of voices, so some standard English, but largely Jamaican part one. So I'll begin with this perspective from Dinah. When I was 18, Leroy, my whatless boyfriend from all age school, wrestled with me one evening in the cane field. I still had on my shorts and panty, so it was pure shock when my period stopped. Nine months later, here come a cotton hair boy pitney, hair picky picky like mine, skin smooth like Leroy, head just as big, face wide and beautiful. Me never see eyelashes long so yet, lips so fine and full, and him little fingernails so pink and perfect, long, long fingers like mama, a strong, firm nose like him knowing going to be one important man. Mama nearly gets epileptic fits when I tell her I'm pregnant. It's just two years I end the job with the Steels, the expat couple who work for the US Embassy in Kingston. We never know what work Mr. Steele do at the embassy, but because of how everybody talk to him, I figure he must be a big shot. Them say him work for CIA, but me don't know if it's true. People say Steel wasn't even them real name. That is a father identity and them in Jamaica to spy on me cause Uncle Sam suspect we're going to get friendly with Fidel Castro in Cuba and America's never want any more communism in them backyard. Let him get your visa, mama used to say, but me never ask and the seals never offer. Mr. Seal, white, pale like a full moon, Mrs. Steele was a black woman, but she much more light-skinned than mama. Her scarves them smell like lavender, and she did wear plenty bangles that looked like them about to drop off her hand. She used to dye her hair red. And when it growing out, the roots used to be black. The red hair usually drop across her eyes, so it's not easy to see her small face. She let me borrow her books, and I read them when I finish work early. That's poetry from Shelley, she did say, or Lord Byron, Malern Keats to Autumn. Season of mist and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run. That woman filling up your head with words, Mama used to say, and suck her teeth. You can eat them, full full girl. The picture of Mrs. Steele in a white apron, serving some plump and juicy words on a plate and me laugh. 
Some evenings, Mrs. Steele tell me about the years them they live in Africa. There are postings in places I never hear about yet, but she show me on a map. She teach literature at universities there, she said, and I watched her eyes turn glass like she was in a trance. Such beautiful people, she said, sweet little babies, and then she would get quiet. The Steels never have any children, although me used to hear Mrs. Steele telling her friends whenever them come over to the house with them pitney how much she did want a baby of her own. Be surprised when they say they're having what Mrs. Steele call a baby shower for me. Party did dead. Between me acting like me want to be there, the two sweet drinks Mrs. Steele made, the balloons losing air, stale biscuits, and the crush of happy delivery sign across the hallway. It was just a four way, them, mama, and me. Mama wear only good dress, a white, stiff, a stiff white colored black shift that make her look like all the blood suck out of her face. The Steels did wear some loose trousers and floral tops. Mrs. Steele said them did buy in Ethiopia. I was in distress since Leroy take up with a brownie named Shelly and moved to Montego Bay. Mama says she's not surprised. Leroy wouldn't want a black girl like me. During the baby shower, I still reeling with shock, sick from the baby or the breakup. Or the two of them together. I couldn't stop wiggle in the chair. So you have no support, Mrs. Steele say. I never know how to answer, so I look over at Mama drinking her Darjeeling tea. We could solve your problem, Mrs. Steele, boy shaky, bad. She look on her husband, who did stand up beside the glass window. Mr. Steele all of a sudden looking hard, hard on something outside. She rub her throat with her fingers and cock her head to one side. Then she say, you've worked with us a long time. So I know, you know, I'd be a good mother. I always wanted my own child. Thank you. I just got chili bumps, you know, <laughs> I just got goosebumps off my arms. Because there's something about your style. There's something about the voice that really rings true. And, you know, it, it, just, it just brings up a well of emotion. And we also got that from the story that um, this book was inspired by, or actually an expansion of, and that's Sun Sun's Birthday, uh, which shortlisted for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize in 2018. And um, if anyone's interested in reading it, you can still find it on Ada. I'm looking at it right now, actually. So um, that's a very interesting question. When we look at this book, when we look at um, the short story itself, Sun Sun's Birthday, it felt like a complete universe already. We were just getting a glimpse into a moment in Diana's life. And so I have to ask, like, was the novel um, first and the short story was inspired <laughs> by that idea or was the short story first? Which one came first, the short story or the novel? So the short story definitely came first. At the time I was living in Barbados, so I'm Jamaican, but partly Bayesian at heart. So I was living and working in Barbados and taking a course at the University of the West Indies Cable Campus. And the course was open to the public, conducted by Professor Jane Bryce, who's a brilliant writer. And this story was submitted as part of that course requirement. So I had to submit that story and I did. And I remember Professor Bryce saying, okay, so what happens, what happens next? So, you know, you passed the course, great. But with the story what happens next and I said what do you mean what happens next so she's like <laughs> okay well surely Apollo is going to go in search of Dinah they're going to connect so what happens when he's around her in Lazarus Gardens which is the community she's from um, and interacts with Damian who may pass on some unwholesome practices to him what's going to happen between Apollo and, and Regina who is a character also introduced in that son's son's birthday story and you know how is Apollo changed if at all and she's asking me some questions that I said well I hadn't actually thought about that but okay I will I will try and expand it but she also told me about the Commonwealth short story prize so she encouraged me to enter and so I did, and I did because I was thinking, okay, well, we'll see how it does. I can maybe get some feedback to strengthen it. And I was pleasantly surprised to have it shortlisted in, in, for the 2018 competition. And um, from there, there was also a bocus list 
Bocas Lit Fest had prizes for emerging writers, uh, Johnson and Amoya Chang. And I won that and that helped me to, to craft it because part of that prize you had to structure, propose us the structure for the novel and uh, part of the prize involved a course at Arvon in, um, in the UK. So doing that course and that workshop really, so you know, I have to credit definitely Commonwealth Writers, definitely Professor Bryce and Bocas and Arvon because together collectively, it they forced me to think about how to expand it into something that you know really could 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 take it to the next level. And that's that's what's important um, for emerging writers, isn't it? Getting your work out there. Sometimes yes, we yeah. hold our narratives close to heart. Once it's on paper, we're like, well, this is mine now, or insofar as oh, this is from my people. But you know, taking a chance, putting it out there, um, taking advantage of opportunities like um, the short story prize with the Commonwealth Foundation really does just expand your world. And it, it, it leads you places you never thought you'd be. Because yes. I do believe you said that you were primarily a short story writer, that yes. you weren't actually thinking about being a novelist. So yes. um, tell me more about that, that journey. That yeah. transition. And I know your journey is the same. You're being too modest. You have won the Caribbean Prize for um, the Commonwealth Short Story Prize. And that led to your Audible, Sunday Times, Audible shortlisting, and stuff like that. So. You, the journey, our journeys are kind of mirrored, right? Because you're now working on, on your novel. So um, I never thought of myself as a novelist before this novel. And I think, you know, it's a funny thing that you, you never know what you are until you do the thing, you know, write a novel, you become a novelist. So you never really think about it until you've, you've written it. And I think for every entrance in the Commonwealth Short Story Prize, it this is why it's so important because it allows you to start, you, know, you can start small, start with, you know, the nucleus or something and giving, get, getting that confidence boost of, of being shortlisted may then help you say, okay, you know, even long listed, you know, being long listed is also an achievement. So it gives you that kind of validation to say, hey, I have something here. Maybe I can develop it, you know? And so, so I think that's, that's very important. You know, it's the only competition of its kind like this, you know, international, to enter and, and and definitely something that offers writers an amazing platform. So when you were um, in this course and you were coming up with the idea for Sun Sun's birthday, which would eventually become this novel, what really inspired um, the story in the first place? What what inspired this 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 world? Well, that's a good question, and it's a hard question because when I'm writing, I'm not consciously thinking about hey what gave rise to this I know I was in the kitchen in my apartment in Barbados at the time and then just hearing Dinah's lines her opening lines you know because the beginning of that story starts with her waking up feeling like she's underwater and sort of expanding that and I'm I am just as surprised as the reader in terms of everything I'm writing how it ends up because I am also going through the journey of discovery I'm not a planner I have what they call a pants in terms of my writing. I describe it to my pants. I, I will just write what I feel the character, that voice is saying, you know, and then at the end, it can be edited. But at the moment, I just go along for the ride. Now, um, I just want to tell you that I'm a big, big fan of the book. I, I think I read it in probably three days once I really had a chance to sit down and read it. And what I think is one of the major arteries, if not the very heart of what a mother's love don't teach you is of course, a mother's love. What she's willing to do for her children, uh, what she's willing to sacrifice and also what she refuses to give up. So can you tell us a little bit more about the title of this novel? Like what does it mean and how does it encapsulate the story as a whole? Okay. So the title, and I have to show the pretty book again because I'm so proud of how pretty it's it is. It's beautiful, it's so pretty. <laughs> very, very gorgeous. Um, credit to my publisher. Um, so the, that line is actually a line of dialogue, from a line of dialogue between uh, Dinah. Dinah says it to Apollo in a conversation and pretty much, you know, the essence of what she's saying to him is, you know, she, she's really wanting him to be a good man. And throughout the novel, she's trying to impart certain wisdom, pieces of wisdom to him about how we should be and, you know, how to be a, basically a decent human being, to care about others and to not always put yourself first. But 
there's a point at which she recognizes as a mother, I can only go so far. There's some things that my, my love is not enough to do. And basically, you as a man, you're going to have to make the, that decision about the kind of human being you want to be. That's in your hands, not mine. And so that that's the heart of what the title is, that there's some things I can't teach you, I can't, and you're going to have to decide for yourself. Mm -hmm. And this story is just as much about manhood as it is about a mother's love. So do you think there's a connection between the two, especially considering um, you know, our region, the Caribbean region, do you think there's a connection between manhood and motherhood? Yes, yeah, so you, we know that in the Caribbean region, it's mainly matriarchal society, a lot of households headed by single moms, you know, and it, it's, it's something that sociologists have studied over years, the fact that, you know, they've been missing father figure in Caribbean homes, who may have multiple families, in fact, but but visiting relationship because they don't live in any one household. Um, so the, the issue is, I guess for me, it kind of, in a way, mirrored my own family. You know, I grew up with my mom and my older brother in Jamaica and my dad lives in England. And, um, you know, for me, it's seeing the bond between my mother and uh, my brother, that strong, strong bond, you know, is something I think inspired this because they're, they're definitely very, very tight. But even in that, there are times my mom would say, you know, like, you know, the, the, the lament of sometimes single mothers, you know, I can't teach a boy how to be a man, you know, or that kind of thing. So that, I think subconsciously, because it's really only afterward I thought about it, I think that's probably what's influencing. Seeing that kind of love and that bond and you know, there's nothing my mother wouldn't do for my brother. And, seeing that upfront and sort of thinking through how that would work in, in this fictional world. And I think, oh, I, I think it's, I think, as you said, there is a connection because there, there's, there's this whole generation of boys and men who were fathered by their mother, you know, and how does that relate to how they feel as a man and what, does, what manhood really means, you know, because yeah, notions of masculinity and all those kinds of ideas um, then are, are raised by that. Mm -hmm. And I think that 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 primary theme really does segue into all the others. You know, we got we talk about um, race, class, gender, neocolonialism, um, and then um, themes of forgiveness, themes of um, moving on. But um, what I find interesting is that what a mother's love don't teach you could easily be set in modern Jamaica. The themes translate to our experience so well, but you chose to set it in the 1980s. So can you tell us a little bit more about that choice? Why the 1980s? Why is it so important to have this story told at that time? Well, I'm an 80s baby. I grew up in the 80s. So, <laughs> you know, and, and some of the technology that we had there, quote unquote technology, um, you know, fascinated the cassette player and the teeth. Like, so, but really, in terms of what the 80s meant for Jamaica as a whole, it was critical. You know, in, in the 70s, our prime minister at the time, you know, was, was flirting with the idea of communism, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, Michael Manley developed a closeness to the Castro uh, in Cuba. And that was a threat to America, who didn't want a second communist country in their backyard. And what it then meant, you know, at least historically, is attempts to, to try to destabilize that union and destabilize Jamaica. Um, you know, there are a lot of talk around CIA activity at the time, um, fiscal policies that were punitive. Um, towards Jamaica embargoes and things like that, um, you know, and then a, a pushing of the other party, the capitalist leaning uh, Jamaica Labour Party. And so in the 80s, you sort of saw the aftermath of that uh, struggle because the party that leaned more towards America won elections and, you know, sort of a country had gone through that kind of struggle, that kind of tug. And thinking on it now, it's the same sort of tug that Apollo goes through when mm -hmm. Diana tries to claim him as her son. And then his, the mother that he always knew, you know, African-American Celeste, tugs on the other side. And um, 
So I think for me, sort of setting that family struggle of two women and this boy, there's the larger struggle of a nation trying, you know, caught between these ideas of communism and capitalism and how, you know, attempts to, to, to lean them towards the American side had far reaching implications for their their day to day lives. So that fascinated me. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna throw something out here because it just you just made me think about this idea of two women fighting over a child. And that's you know for our, that's a biblical reference right there. I mean it's actually in the first couple of pages. Um, when you were writing the story, were you considering that? Was that in your head? What this, 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 um, you know, this, the story of Solomon and the two and the two mothers fighting over the child. Um, I noticed that in your work, there are a lot of religious undertones, but yes. they, 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 they just um, string so well into the human experience. So, can you tell us a little bit more about those influences in your novel? Yeah, I think. You know, wherever you stand on religion, most people can agree that the, the Bible is a very significant book. And some of the stories there are so rich, you know, that the, the open with the story of King Solomon having to decide the matter of whose child is this among two women. Um, so I, I don't think I'm, I do it consciously. Like a lot of my writing, Alexia, it's like afterwards, I'm like, oh, you know, I, I, I don't <laughs> say, okay, I'm writing to this theme or writing to this sort of I'm a product of all the experiences I've had and all the things I've read and all the things that you know I've lived up to now and they inevitably find their way into the work you know and that quote that big that's put at the beginning of the book actually about that story of King Solomon and that thing that came after it wasn't until after I was like oh you know like who put that at the front I wasn't conscious of it <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I love is that um, without giving too much away, I don't want to spoil, but Apollo is given that right. Apollo is given that agency to make a decision. And yes. I love that we've been giving, given a young man the power to choose. And, um, I, and I think that's another interesting thing about this book. You know, there's some head hopping, but I love the different characters, the different voices that you have narrating this experience. Um, I think it's one of the most engrossing elements about what a mother's love don't teach you. I think yeah. that each character like represents an integral part of Jamaica, um, whether or not they're permanent residents or temporary residents. But I know it must have been very difficult for you to choose whose stories to tell. So how did you choose whose stories to tell, which characters to focus the light on? Okay, well, yeah, there, there is a lot of heads to in this novel um, because I... I I'm a believer in voice. Like I love writing different voices. You know, that's one of the things I enjoy most. And so I, some chapters are from Diana's perspective, some her mother, his mama, um, Celeste, Apollo's mother, um, Apollo himself, you know, and also there's even like a second person chapter in there, you know, where the reader becomes a character, like you observe this thing. Um, I think for me, um, Again, for me, writing is playful, it's experimentation. It's not, at least the first draft, one is serious stuff. So I kind of said to myself, okay, how, what, what can keep it interesting for me? You know, what can I play with in, in this writing? Because if I'm bored in writing, the reader is going to be bored in reading it. And so that influenced the choice of using different voices because I just love voice. And I also think that there's, there's the danger of seeing things through just one lens all the time because different characters will have different perspectives on the same mm -hmm. incident, you know? People mm -hmm. tell you, yeah, four people watch a car accident, ask them what happened, they're gonna give you four different stories. Some will even say different colors of the cars involved. So it's, for me, seeing the story from different perspectives, through different eyes, as a richness of, of the different shades of truth, you know, um, as each person experiences it. So to give our richness to the events themselves. So mm -hmm. that's why. Speaking about um, your characters, I mean, sometimes a writer will have their favorite characters. So are, are there any characters that you hold near and dear to your heart? Were there any characters whose stories are just really easy to tell? Um, or maybe some characters were a little bit difficult um, to portray. Like, which characters do you really, would you really enjoy writing? I think clearly Apollo was the most difficult to write. Um, it was harder to relate to him 
And so his, his sections were always more difficult for me. Um, Dinah came more easily, Mama came more easily. Um, and, and, and it's hard because I don't have a favorite. It's like saying to a parent who's your favorite child, I really don't. Um, but there's some that were a little bit more fun to write. So there's the, the era Don, who's the villain in the story called British. Um, some things in his thing were a lot of fun to write. I had to actually chop some of it, you know, it was a little too much. <laughs> but I mean, he's a horrible character, horrible. But, you know, there's still something about him that, you know, his, his conviction that he's doing the right thing for the citizens of Lazarus Gardens and his own pain and his own motherlessness um, in a way can endure him in some way. Um, so I think British was the most fun to write. You mentioned the word motherlessness. And mm -hmm. when you're reading the novel, you realize that so many characters are motherless. Again, without giving away too much, you know, we have um, Dinah, she, her mother is alive, but she's not necessarily present. Um, Celeste, she, her mother is alive, but again, not necessarily present. And then you have characters like Damien, Regina, who no longer have their mothers. So um, wh what do you think um, is the effect or the influence of that motherlessness on these characters, on the lived experience, not only in Jamaica, but in the region? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's true that mothers are nurturers. And when you remove that from a child in the formative years, it can't help but have an a impact in how you see the world. I mean, for me, I always had my mom. She was around all the time, still around, thank God. Um, but like that rock, you know, that, that pivotal figure in, in, my, in my life and in my mother's life. And I guess as a writer, you would want to... to think about the what if you know how would it be if if, she, if that wasn't the experience you know how would the loss of a mother affect how these characters relate so for some of them you know in in the case of let's say Damien and Regina it causes them to be drawn to Dinah as a substitute mother figure um it it also in Celeste's case although she resents her mother she in a way becomes her mother in terms of Con, trying to control um, Apollo. So, you know, there are ways in which we try to seek out other mothers or we try to mother others or we end up copying the, the mother behavior that uh, pushes us away or alienates us from our mothers in the first place. So different dynamics um, which play out in the story through different characters. And we kind of see that also happen in regards to fathers as well, don't we? We find yes. that a lot of the characters are also drawn to father figures. And yes. unfortunately, uh, one of those father figures is British. <laughs> yes, yes. So, yes. so um, I guess it's along those same lines, right? We're, fill, we're trying to fill in that gap. We know that there is something missing and we're trying to find it there. Yes, exactly, exactly. So there is a sense of, again, remember we talked about the, society, Caribbean societies, um, the absence of the father figure in the home. And again, sociologists would tell you that's why the Aerodons or the drug lords, they attract a lot of young men who they look who look up to them, who see them as, okay, this is my father figure, you know, and, and sometimes these gang members are really just searching for that father figure and they find it in the criminal elements who would say, okay, I'll give you a purpose, I'll give you a meaning. This is, I'll give you a job, you have something to do. You work for me, I'm, I oversee you. I make sure that everything is good for you. Um, you know, I'll watch out for you, I'll have your back kind of thing, which are the things that, that protection and that, you know, purpose that a father is supposed to give. Um, so yeah, in the novel as well, we see how present fathers are and what um, implications of that are. So. Celeste's husband is actually Apollo's stepfather. So he's lost his, what he, who he has been told is his biological father and mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. growing up with that stepfather, that kind of stepfather dynamics and what that would have meant since his stepfather is white and he's black. And, um, you know, that additional element of growing up as a black man in a privileged white community and what that would have meant for his sense of self and his sense of manhood as well. Um, and that's also something that Diana tries to help him through. Mm -hmm. 
Now, we see a lot of this, um, we see the uh, Dinah's need to um, help Apollo coming up as early as Sun Sun's birthday, right? And that leads me back to this idea of, you know, transitioning from the short story to the mm -hmm. novel. Because like I said, this story already felt fl fully fleshed as early as um, Sun Sun's birthday. Um, and so after all of your successes and victories in the short story genre, I mean, you've been, I mean, you've won the um, Johnson and Mo Chong um, Caribbean Writers Prize. Uh, you won the Frank Colomar Literary Endowment Prize. Um, I could go on and on about mm -hmm. all of your achievements, but did you find that that short story experience was an advantage when it came to writing a longer novel? Um, I think so, because really, you, you could look at each chapter in a novel as a short story in its own, you know, you have to have a beginning, middle, end, you know, some conflict, some peak, some resolution in some way. Um, but I would, I would say that the heart of a good story, whether it's in a short form or it's a long form, you have to have characters that feel compelling to the reader, because once you have that, they will follow you to 200 or 300 or in my case, about 400 pages <laughs> to see what happens with the character. So I would encourage, you know, if, if short story writers are, are watching this interview, that first find characters that you love, that you are in love with, that whose voice you can write in a compelling way. And then, you know, you can maybe plot out um, the bigger picture by asking the same kind of what if questions that Professor Bryce asked me, you know, what would happen next year? Um, how could this, you know, they talk about art. So th this relationship has begun this way. What's the journey this relationship could go through? How may, might it end? Um, you know, what conflict this character could face? What is the thing that this character cares most about and wants to achieve and what? obstacles can I put in the way of them getting it, which is which is really the heart of, of what it's about. But again, you know, I would encourage them, start with characters that you love, that you want to follow, that you as a writer want to be, okay, I want to know what happens next too, you know? And that is, I think, the heart of, of building out a short story into a novel. Characters, voice, conflict situations, um, you know, and I, and I think once you have that, just just trust yourself and, and just have fun. Just have fun. And that's the thing, because as you're reading What a Mother's Love Don't Teach You, you're following each character and you're just having fun watching them on their journey. You're always guessing what decisions are they going to be making next? And it just feels so fluid. And that's what I love about your style in your short stories. And from what I can hear, another one, two, three, or maybe four manuscripts on the horizon. <laughs> I got to ask, as a lawyer and a writer, how do you juggle all of those projects? How do you juggle with your short stories, with your novels, and your daytime job? How do you do it? Asking for a friend. <laughs> it's hard. It's very hard. Um, but the thing about it is... Um, I try to write weekends because during the week I have a demanding corporate job. I really don't get the time. But I try to use my weekends and I write. Um, it's sacrifice because it means I can't do some other things. You know, I can't. Uh, I, I can't explore a whole lot of other hobbies. You know, the time that I have that free time, I try to use it for writing. But it's it's in a way for me, writing is therapeutic. It's how it helps me make sense of the world. You know, it helps me to process feelings and emotions and to, you know, disappear into new worlds. So for me, I write as much for myself as I do the reader because it's it's helpful for me. You know, it's a way to relieve stress, it's a way to just use my imagination. Um, so, I mean, God forbid if, if I'm never able to publish anything again, I still write because I, I just can't help myself just can't <laughs> but that passion what what it shows is that this journey will continue moving forward for you because you can tell all of those examinations and all of those queries that you ask of yourself they really do flesh out in the work and that I, in particular this novel is just so it, it's just so fresh and alive i think that it's following um writers like kai miller and, and anyone who loves caribbean writing 
will love this book. I, I feel it. I know it because I'm one of those people. So, but I think that, I think that you've already, um, you know, really explained what it means to be a writer and how to, you know, progress on this journey, having that passion. You don't need another hobby if you love this. So, I mean, I feel the same way. Um, always, you know, asking yourself the right questions in regards to character development, and then getting your work out there, you know, taking the risk and, you know, with your work to, you know, take it to the next level. Uh, is there anything else that you would advise emerging writers? Mm -hmm. So I, I think I've said it quite a lot in this interview, but I'll say again, enter competitions, you know, come with a short story prize is, is something that I'd encourage them to do. Um, you know, there are other ones out there, you know, uh, the, the, Queen Mary was a free one, which are also one for fiction. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of great competitions out there. You know, just just the point is just right. Have something to enter. You know, don't be daunted by oh, the, you know, is it going to be good enough? Because I think there's a paralysis sometimes when you know writers tend to feel it has to be perfect, and you know, if it's not perfect, oh, I can't enter. You know, I would say a little story. There was a story that won one of the prizes. I won't say which. And um, I entered it into a journal. And the journal wrote me back and said, okay, this is just not for us. But then that same story ended up winning a prize. So all it is to say that your story will find its home. It will find its right home in time. You know, and you just have to, to, to trust that you will find its readers, you know. But, but the key thing is to get writing. You know, it's it's something that we should try to do regularly. You know, it's a muscle that you have to build. You have to keep working at it. And don't expect perfection. You know, I, I write quickly. As you know, Alexia, like I could just bangle something in my I'm so jealous. <laughs> but that thing is still very rough. Ask my editor. You know, we spend then the next several months building it into something that is readable, that, you know, is, is strong. So I think everybody will have a different style, but the key thing is to just write, just write. Thank you so much, Madam, for sharing your just amazing journey with us and having me here to ride along with you. It's been an amazing conversation. And I just want to tell everyone out there that if you're looking for a touching story about you know motherhood, about um, you know, journey into manhood about um, just about the Caribbean experience. What a mother's love don't teach you. Just encapsulate that entire that entire experience and journey there. So, thank you so much, Sharma, and thank you and to the Commonwealth Foundation for having thank us. You. And it makes a difference when you have writer friends in your corner. That's the other tip. Make sure you surround yourself with people who have the same passion as you, who encourage you along the way. Um, because the journey can sometimes feel solitary, but when you have good writer friends who have your back and who will give you feedback, as Alexia does for me, that makes a world of difference. <laughs>